Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the second Sunday of Advent, which this year falls on December 8th. That's 2024. For the first reading, you have a choice. You can read Baruch 5, 1 through 9, or Malachi 3, 1 through 4. We're going to talk about Malachi, just because we thought that would be more fun. The psalm, this is a non-Salter psalm. This is from Luke 1, 68 through 79, the Benedictus of Zechariah. The second reading, Philippians 1, 3 through 11, and the gospel text, Luke 3, 1 through 6. As is his custom, John the Baptist shows up on the second Sunday of Advent to say, what are you doing there? And we'll continue into next week, which is yeah. important because in the in the larger scheme of Luke, uh, of course, we have John the Baptist has a very large role and we have the intertwining of John the Baptist and Jesus' birth stories, but also that this introduction of Jesus by John the Baptist in, well, our text for today, three, one through six, but then it continues uh, seven, you know, seven to the baptism of Jesus to uh, verse 20 in chapter three uh, is, is really important to pay attention to. And I think is one way to, enter into this text for Advent and Advent preaching is what does John say about Jesus? Who is Jesus? And, uh, and what is he announcing about what we, about who Jesus is and who Jesus will be that we need to pay attention to. And uh, so this ministry of John here and the emphasis on that is all in, is um, of course his witness, but it's introdu- it's an introduction to Jesus, and mm-hmm. so we need to I think then pay attention to okay then what is he what is he saying about who Jesus is? First thing, pretty obvious, but it's important. <laughs> the commentary makes note of this, uh, and and that is that this is set in time. And uh, it's important for us to realize that um, we can get into the controversies in terms of dating and things of that nature. But the key here is that these events that are being recorded are being um, are, are being reported alongside events that were significant for the people in the nations, for the peoples of the world, for peoples beyond those who encountered Jesus, or in this particular case, who who encountered John. And um, those particular moments in history um, become overshadowed because. When the world changes, God is made visible, or so it is in this testimony. Um, We have the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and then everything shifts. Uh, Valleys are filled, mountains are lowered, the world is changing. And we can talk about that physically, but we can also talk about that metaphorically, but our attention becomes turned to the God who is the same yesterday and forever. And that makes another um, powerful entry or continuation into the season of Advent. Yes, things are changing, but the God who is the same is showing up. And what God is going to do, is, it should give us confidence. Yeah, there's, a, there's an aspect of John's message that's pay attention, you know, Pay attention to what's going on here. And some of that comes out in the focus on repentance, which is Mm -hmm. not just a Lucan word, but is a really important word for Luke and for Acts. And I'm sure I say this every year. I I don't think repentance is, especially in Luke Acts, I don't think repentance is shape up your life, stop doing bad things and do good things. First and foremost, it's recognize what's happening here. It's It's a statement about finding a new perspective, adopting a new perspective, seeing the truth about yourself, seeing the truth about what's going on, and seeing the truth about God's own presence now in this moment. And so that's why the language of see in verse six is so important. We'll see a lot of 
a visual language throughout Luke Acts as well to describe, do you really know who Jesus is? There'll be language of visitation. We'll see some of that in John's father's psalm in a few minutes. So we'll see some of that um, when Jesus comes to Jerusalem in, in Luke 19 as well. The city didn't recognize its visitation from God. And so in Luke, I mentioned this last week, when Jesus shows up, that is salvific. John's doing the baptism for forgiveness of sins here. And now when Jesus comes, what John's saying is, here is salvation. Here is salvation and fleshed. Here is the response or the, the fulfillment of all of these promises now among us. And that requires, I don't want to say new eyes to see. That's what, I don't want to make it just tied to vision. But that requires a mind to grasp or a perspective to grasp something that's upside down or something that's totally unexpected and disruptive. Yeah, I absolutely. And it goes back to what we were saying earlier about Luke, some of those themes that we want to start remembering each time we're talking about Luke of attentiveness of seeing this is who Jesus is as well. And so that, that, that call to, to seeing and what, and as you said, Matt, the repentance of that reorienting of perspective, right, or a change of perspective, that that's in part what is happening in this text, but also in Advent. But of course, do you, being able to see that uh, that salvation is present in Jesus, and so uh, again, again, like I said, we just have those we have those themes that we've already talked about that we're wanting. We'll we'll keep talking about now until your A rolls around again. That's but, it. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's throughout the entire gospel of Luke. And I think what you were talking about joy too is, uh, and the commentary talks about this a little bit as well, but that this, this salvation enters into um, specific historical moment uh, that is marked by all of these details of the rulers. And we've talked about that before, but uh, it is uh, that even of itself, I think, is a challenge to get our heads around or to see, if you will, that God makes the decision to enter into history to become temporal in such a way. Mm -hmm that is also upending, right? Mm -hmm. It's also something that you don't expect. And so it's it's like the mountains and hills be made low and the crookeds be coming straight. It's like, that's not how it works. Uh, so we're being asked to see something that uh, that is really something, <laughs> <laughs> right? There's a quote I can't remember and maybe one of you know um, how it ends, but it begins, how odd of God. How odd of God to choose the Jews. Is that, that what it is? That's what I've heard. Okay. Okay. But it is a disrupting once again. Yeah. And about the particularity, right? Yeah. So for Luke is very concerned to show us that Jesus is Jewish and yes. in a practicing Jewish family. But then you've already got early on. Chapter two with Simeon, and now you know, light to the Gentiles, and now all flesh will see the salvation of God. So it's this interesting, this rooted in time and space and people and culture and identity. And a and we'll family and a nation. Yeah. But for the sake of all the world. Yeah. And maybe maybe we should do something time. crazy and jump to Luke one. Oh okay. yes. Since oh, that Luke is one the introduces us to John. It is just to John as well as to Jesus, right? Yes. We get now his, his father's prophecy, mm -hmm. we're told, mm -hmm. um, about both Jesus and then John. Which begins off, blessed be the God of... Israel. Yes. Yeah. Did you want to say more about that, Matt, in terms of that introduction or... Well, it's an interesting, you know, it's a psalm. It's, it's you know, all of the canticles in Luke 1 and 2 are, I think either explicitly identified as prophecy like this one or clearly prophetic utterances from the person stating them, uh -huh. including Mary. I wish we heard what Anna could say, but she's identified as a prophet as well. And mm -hmm. so for Zechariah here, it's 
I mean, he starts off talking about God, blessings to God. Then he goes to describing who Jesus is for us in verse 69 through 75. Then verse 76, there's his turn to his newborn son, John, right? And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. Prepare the way, but then to give his people knowledge of salvation. But then as well, um, the line here of uh, of the dawn from high breaking upon us, shine, you know, those who sit in darkness, the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. I mean, there's this lovely image here because Luke 1 and 2 is such a dreamscape, right? Everybody is expecting the Messiah. Everybody responds perfectly. Everybody's thrilled. And then you turn to chapter three and you're like, it's a whole new world. It's the real world now. And John's out there calling people to account, calling powerful people to account, calling everybody to repentance. And nobody seems to have remembered any of this stuff from Luke 1 and 2. Right, right. But what's it going to look like? And so John is part of that movement of calling people out of darkness into light, to borrow a term Paul uses in the book of Acts, um, taking people out of you know, shadow into daylight, taking people out of, of ignorance into knowledge and all of those things. And so the to me, the the canticle here helps shine a light on the, the nitty grittiness of this work. It's not just simply Jesus is going to appear and, you know, beams are going to radiate from his body that change the world. It's going to be much more localized and difficult. Well, and two, that, that, uh, that both... Zechariah and Mary situate what's what's happening now with Jesus in that larger continuity of God's character. I uh, and I think that is really important. I really liked how the commentary too talked about made the connection that you know Zechariah has been silent all this time, and so he's uh, he's been listening to Mary as she sang and, uh, and, uh, and, and the way in which, uh, the, you know, the, the connections that she's making of what's been done to her is the same God of the God of her, of her ancestors. And, uh, and then now Zechariah makes that claim too. And so it's, uh, it, it also, I think, invites us to listen for those songs, uh, those songs that are being sung about God's favor, um, and that how is it that that in and of itself is uh, salvation? That God, God's God's salvation is being favored, mm. and being regarded mm-hmm. by God, and the least of these. And so, I think the. I think that connection might invite that for a congregation to listen for those, listen to those songs of being favored and the connections that people are making between past, the past, present, and future of God's activity in the world. Should we go to Malachi? Malachi. Yes. I can't read this without hearing little Handel's Messiah in the background. Oh. <laughs> you, you mentioned this last week, Matt, and I, um, I wanted to to lift it up, and that is a reminder that we are in a season that is not merely a season of celebration, but it is the question of who can endure the day mm-hmm. of the coming of the Lord, and uh, uh, who can stand uh, when He appears. And Malachi points that out. I like to say that um, the the uh, the presence of God is not so much uh, uh, a fire in the hearth as it is um, a pink slip from your employer. And uh, I, I thought of that and held it to now for the text, but I thought of that, Matt, um, when you were talking about uh, how the, um, I'm not going to quote you exactly right, but you were talking about who the folks that were in charge, the folks who thought they were king uh, or in power were dethroned. Um, and so that the pink slip is recognizing it's not us that are on the throne, but it truly is. It is. It is God. Um, and so, um, so you set us up for this portion. And one of the th- I love the book of Malachi, but one of the things I like being reminded of is uh, that there there is um, a disruption, a pulling mm-hmm. the rug out from under everything. 
that is a part of this season that should not be forgotten. Yeah. Malachi addresses priests. You know, it's it's a book that's not directed to the general public, so to speak. So people with a particular responsibility who occupy particular offices. Who who should know? Who do know that? Uh, who can stand when he appears in the priestly mindset? Right, we're right. we're trying to control the space, right? Uh, because we recognize that God is a consuming fire. Uh, but then, as well, I think it'd be helpful. This will help set up a preacher for next week when John's going to start talking about Jesus and wheat and chaff and unquenchable fire and stuff like that. That that imagery of fire in so much of the Old Testament is about purification as opposed to pain, punishment, destruction, that it's about, um, it, it's it, it's bringing something corrupted into an incorruptible state, right? It's, mm-hmm. And so uh, for people who have been subjected to steady diets of hellfire and brimstone, it might be good to start to kind of pull some of the pegs out of that, out of that structure and help them see that some of this language is hopeful not saying it might not be painful <laughs> to be uh, to to be purified by God, um, but the goal here is restoration. The goal here is not um, um, what's the word I want? Just punishment for punishment's sake, right? Or retribution is the word I was looking for. In your reminder that this is to the leaders, this is to the priests, uh, those who are bringing uh, those um, uh, offerings uh, before God. Uh, this text acknowledges that they're bringing forth these, they're practicing these rituals, they're bringing forth these offerings, but what it is that God is looking for, what is truly um, uh, the righteousness of their offering is not going through the rituals, but it's offering kindness and fairness and justice to others. So Philippians 1, we ready to move there. We did... First Thessalonians last week with a whole lot of thanksgiving and gratitude and holiness. And we're going to start there again. I think so. I thank my God. But then there's going to be, you know, talk of joy, Jay Moore, <laughs> in this one, a very joyful letter. What do we do with this? Why is this here for Advent? Um, because the work that God has done, I think Caroline talked about this earlier, uh, is being continued. This is the work of God. This is what God is doing. The one who began a good work in you. Uh, we talked about this as we made that transition to recognizing that, oh, how odd of God to choose the Jews. Um, this is the continuation of what it is that God has been doing, and God will complete it. It is God's good work to complete it in the day of Jesus. I think, too, for me, this this reminds me that Advent is not only about waiting and expectation and anticipation and attention and observance, but and we'll get to this next week with the questions that uh, that the various and sundry people ask John. Well, then, what shall we do? And and so for me, it's this the Paul praising with joy or 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 uh, thanking God for their partnership in the gospel. That is that is this abounding of, of love. That is this overflowing of love. And so, for me, it 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 asks the question: Okay, Advent is 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 all of those things, uh, but how are you participating in the love that's going to come down uh, and and join us and be among us and. Uh, is it is it only um, is it only the gift that you receive, <laughs> or mm-hmm. is, is it become the gift that you give others? And so there's I think there's a move to yeah move to uh, this is, Advent is not a passive shouldn't be a passive time it should be wondering waiting but also wondering how how will I partner in this love that has now come down to earth. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide 
since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.